Well, good afternoon. Some of you I know and some of you I don't. My name's Terry, I'm the pastor of Friends Community Church, and it's my pleasure today to step in in the place of the United Church pastor who couldn't make it today. But I have to say that looking over at Lyle, when I would look over in our church and see you sitting there, I expected Lois to be sitting beside you. And today that's different. And we need to just recognize that that's a reality, that's the truth of this day, that we're here to say goodbye. We're here to bring closure to a life as is in the obituary, a life well lived. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I'd like to just read a few verses for you folks to open today and then a prayer, and then I'm looking forward to hearing singing from this family, and I'm looking forward to hearing the obituary. I've read it through several times today, but there's something different about hearing somebody read it themselves, a family member. But I'd like to share these words with you this morning, or this afternoon, excuse me. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it, for he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. The earth is the Lord's. And on today, when we're saying somebody is going back into the earth, their soul is in heaven, it's important to recognize that it's God who created it in the first place and God who created us and all things are created by him. Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? God created all things and he also gave us a way to peace and a way to peace that Lois recognized and accepted into her life. And while she's completely at peace now, she also had the peace of knowing that even in her dementia, even in her a loss of memory, she had a certain peace that she knew she was going to be okay. And that's important to remember. And she knew that because of the words of another psalm, a familiar one that says, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. And there's still waters beside that. Today, that's exactly where she is. She's at peace. There's somewhere that it's green pastures and calm waters there's no loss of memory today. There's no uh, mending of broken bones. There's no poor health. There's just peace on this day. And as we go into the next uh, few minutes and remembering her life, I think it's really important that we remember she is completely at peace today. And for that, we're grateful. And for that, today is a bit of a celebration as well as a time of tears. I invite you to join me in prayer. God, today we're here together as a family, and I thank you for me personally for the privilege of being a small part of this today. Uh, it truly is a privilege and an honor to be here, and I, I personally thank you for that, God. I thank you for this family that have come together and the family members that can't be here today. We're all here in spirit. We're one in that spirit in remembering a wife, a mother, a grandmother and a great-grandmother, remembering somebody that has impacted on a number of generations through her smile, through her gentleness, through her teaching, through her music, and through her sense of humor, but mostly just through her love. We thank you for her and we thank you for taking her home. And today we just uh, offer this up to you as a way of celebrating her and her life but also celebrating the fact that she had given her life to you. And we thank you for that in a very, very special way. I pray all of this in the name of our Lord and Savior. Amen. We're going to proceed uh, without announcements. So for the folks who are going to come up and share, uh, just sort of follow through. Your family, you know each other. And, uh, and it's, it, keep this as intimate and as together as you can. You don't have to share this with a whole bunch of people today, and that's something special.
Lois Allison, age 91, died on April 7, 2021, at Bueller Active Living Centre in Winkler, Manitoba. Lois was the loving wife to Lyle Allison of Roland for 63 years. I know you can all read. If you cannot read, you cannot be a descendant of Lois Allison or you did not spend enough time with her. So I'm not going to read you the exact text you have in front of you. This is going to be the story version. My mother loved to tell stories and to hear stories, especially true stories. So these are some short stories about my mother and some stories that my mother told. Mom was one of six children and she loved her brothers and her sisters dearly, sister, sorry, dearly, and she loved to talk about her childhood. One story she told and mentioned a few times, and I'm going to retell here, is that the boys loved playing hockey and skating. And sometimes there'd be some natural ice near the farm that they could clear off and skate. And so they'd get everybody ready and they'd push Mom and Verna to get their skates on and get out there. And Mom and Verna and the boys would clean off all the ice and then the boys would say, okay, you guys are done, we'll play hockey now. And they never understood why Mom and Verna weren't in much of a hurry to get their skates on. Hmm. My mother told this story a few times. You might recognize it. Her father decided one day that he'd like to take the kids tobogganing. And so they went out. And there was a hill, okay, maybe more of a bunker over there they thought they'd use. There was a bunker because that was the winter they lived inside the fence of the cordite plant. It looked like a good place to toboggan. However, the guard did not think so. The guard that came over and spoke to my mother's father said, what are you doing here? Get out of here. This is the cordite plant. And he said, no, no, it's okay. We live right there. And the guard said, no, no one lives here. And apparently grandfather did convince him. And the guard said, go back home and stay there. In the spring, they moved to a farm two miles away and continued having a dairy and grain farm. <laughs> My mother always said when choosing a profession, she thought she had three choices. She could be a secretary, a nurse, or a teacher. She said she didn't think she'd be a good secretary. She did not want to be a nurse, and so she was a teacher. I do not think that's really fair. Mom's calling was to be a teacher. Teaching to her was as natural as breathing. She was always teaching. And she was a good teacher. The students from Oakland School, which I understand is somewhere in the Cane Low Farm area, 
wrote to her for years. The superintendent there wrote a letter. Nope, that's not right. The superintendent's wife wrote a letter to her begging her to please teach there the next year. I have been with mom when students from Roland and Portage La Prairie have come up to her and said, you were my teacher, you were such a good teacher, or you were my favorite teacher. But even more than wanting to be a teacher, mom wanted to be a wife and mother. And so she did what young nurses and teachers and perhaps others did there, was she taught for a little while here, a little while there, and checked out the prospects. And she didn't teach anywhere more than a year in a row, except Roland. So I'm thinking the prospects, or I mean prospect, here must have been better. You probably know that mom and dad met at the Roland Square Dancing Club, but you might not know this part of the story that mom told me. They were getting ready for a presentation of square dancing. And dad and mom were to be partners, and that was working out nicely, she thought. But then he was sick for two weeks, the two weeks before the presentation. And she had a different partner. And she was actually thinking maybe it would be better if that Lyle guy didn't show up, because he might not know the steps. But he did show up. And she said he did the steps fine. And she said she was really glad he showed up. My mother has the best memories of our childhood. She says, with a straight face, that we were always all so good. And I said to her, Mom, what about when you were driving and you said, I'm going to pull over and spank you all? And she looked at me and did not believe that had ever happened. Just totally didn't believe me. She also says, her babies were not fussy, which is lovely. Except I did once hear her say, well, if I couldn't take the crying, I just went and hoed in the garden for a few minutes. Hmm. Mom was always teaching. When I started writing about her, I put she believed in teaching. One of my editors, as in sisters, said I should put she loved teaching and learning. Both are true. A new idea would fascinate her. She got us up in the middle of the night to watch the moon landing. Both my mother and my father were always ready to teach. In fact, sometimes you started regretting the question. My mother was an avid reader, and I remember her reading the newspaper at the kitchen table, and I kind of remember her sitting in a chair with a book, but I think she did most of her reading by accident. She peeled potatoes or carrots onto a piece of newspaper. And as she was doing that, she'd see something that look, looked a little bit interesting. Then she'd be pushing the peels aside so she could read the rest of the article. My father was forever saying, I'm going to get her some plain brown paper so supper can be ready on time. Another time texts attacked her was when she was tidying up. It's probably hard for you to imagine it, but there were times when my sisters and I didn't put things away how we should. And perhaps there was a book somewhere, and my mother picked up the book, and she's going to go put it away. And now she's standing in the middle of the room, perfectly still, reading. And she could read there for a long time. My mother was very absorbed when she was reading. She didn't really notice too much that was going on around her. And Gwen and I might have sort of taken advantage of that. Sometimes if we were a bit bored, we'd think maybe there was something good in the attic. Those walk-up attics are amazing. And so we would sneak up to the attic, and you must know we were not allowed to go to the attic without permission. So we'd just kind of sneak up to the attic and have a look around, and. If we were really lucky when we got downstairs, mom was reading. Because then we would say, hey, mom. He said, OK, if we go up to the attic and get the whatever treasure we got our eyes on that day. And she would make some 
random mumbling sort of a scent noise, and we'd run upstairs and get our treasure. Then later in the day, she'd say, girls, were you in the attic? And we'd say, yes, mom, you said we could, we could, mm -hmm, you said it. My mother loved reading to us and to her grandchildren. She read us the short books that most people do when you're little, but she also read us some quite long texts. She read us Heidi, The Land of Og, and The Borrowers. She read us from Hurlbut's story of the Bible, and many more. She told me once she would have kept reading to us forever, but we quit letting her. My mother became comfortable with physical affection later in life. She hugged us and kissed us when we were little, but sometimes it was a little bit limited. She always tucked us in bed at night. And we'd talk for a few minutes, and then she'd listen to our prayer, and then she would give us one kiss and leave the room. It was quite possible to hear Gwen or I saying, no, no, don't kiss me, don't kiss me, because that meant our nice chat was over and she was leaving. We called her the disappearing fairy because one kiss and she was gone. I realized why she could be a little skimpy with kisses when she told me this story. The day she went to teach in her first school, the truck was already packed, her brother was waiting for her and she went to say goodbye to her parents and her father gave her a kiss. She was so shocked that he kissed her that she thought she must be going off into the dragon's den and was scared, and she actually cried because that kiss was so significant. No wonder the kisses weren't her easiest thing. However, later in life she became much more huggy and kissy. In fact, she said to me more than once, people hug a lot more than they used to. I like that. Have I ever taught you to play steel? Yes, Grandma's after supper line. Have I ever taught you to play steel? Grandma loved games, card games, word games, other games. And one of her favorite games to play with her grandchildren was a simple card game named Steel. Now my mother could be a little proper sometimes, she liked things to be nice. She wasn't sure she should be teaching her grandchildren steal, even though she'd already taught them all it several times. So she decided the game should be called give and take. Her grandchildren did not let her get away with that. My mother once told me, in all seriousness, that she felt sorry for people whose grandchildren were not as wonderful and smart as hers. And I said, but mom, all grandmas feel that way. That's just how it goes. And she paused for a minute and thought, and she said, no, mm -mm. really, Karen, I feel sorry for grandparents whose grandchildren are not as wonderful and smart as mine. She totally believed her grandchildren were the top. Mom loves sing singing. She knew the lyrics to many, many songs. As we were preparing for this, I thought it very interesting that different families and different groups thought that mom's favorite songs were different things. The Whites mentioned a song I've never heard of that apparently grandma sang to them regularly. It happened in other places too. Gwen suggested a hymn that I was like, does mom know that? Huh. That's how many songs she knew, more than we even recognized. My mother was generally accepting of change, but she was not interested in moving out of the farmhouse. She was really resistant to that idea. In fact, she said the only way she was leaving that house was in a pine box. We were worried. But things had to change. She needed more care than she was getting. And Doug and Linda had this great idea. They would attach a house trailer, which she didn't like me to say it was her small house, but you know, just so you understand what I'm talking about, to their house. And they could look after mom and dad, but mom and dad could have privacy. It was a great idea. Mom didn't really think so yet. So Doug and Linda got it all ready, and it took quite a bit of work. And then the rest of us sisters helped a little bit with, you know, setting up the kitchen and putting some things in it. 
And then we brought Mum for her first night there. And we were pretty worried because she had been more adamant than ever that this was not a good thing. And my amazing mother walked into the trailer and said, did you girls bring all my beautiful things here? Look, my lovely things are here. Oh, you are so kind to me, thank you. That was just so amazing. I, I'm getting chills just thinking about how wonderful it was for her to switch and compliment us and not be angry about it. What a wonderful person. I do want to thank the Wiltons, and especially Linda and Fauna, for looking after my mom and dad for the last seven years. The time, dedication, and love that you have spent on them is amazing, and thank you so much for doing that. There was never a better situation available than that. While I am making a family mention, I do want to mention that the Greens are not able to be here today. Mavis had surgery on Friday, and she's recovering well, and the pre-treatments apparently did a very good job. So things are really looking up there. However, her children couldn't attend because of the risk of contamination. Mom and Dad needed more care recently, and they moved into the Bueller Center in Winkler in January. Mom's gentle spirit and patience impressed the staff there, and I am told she did manage to tell some stories about her children and grandchildren, even though she wasn't able to do a lot of things. A friend of mine and I were talking about my mother yesterday, and she commented, well, that was a life well lived. And it was. We will all miss Lois Allison so much, but let's remember her stories, and let's remember her in our stories.
Today is your day. Today is a day for family. And today is a day to remember the connection of life with death. And it sounds stark when I use the word death. It sounds almost harsh, but it is a reality of this day. Somebody has died, somebody has moved on. Lois is no longer here. Grief is individual. Each one of you has to grieve in your own way. Each one of you has your own memories. Some of those memories are wonderful. But everybody's a human being, which means that sometimes relationships have difficult sides to them too. Not everything goes as we want it to go, and so that is part of the individual memories when somebody leaves. And when it's our time to go, that will be the memories people will have of us as well. And at a funeral, it's, it's a good time to remember that if there's things that we need to resolve with members of our family, it's probably not a bad time to do that. I've had to do that in my family several times, and each time I've been happy to do it, and yet there's more to do. And I would say that I've had a wonderful family, right? I've had a wonderful time with my family and expect to continue to do that. But each of you has to grieve Lois in your own way. But we are grieving together. This is family. This is more than just a collection of individuals off in their own lives. This is people coming together as family during COVID on this day to say that we want to honor the life of Lois. And so today the grief is about the loss of somebody you have lived life with, somebody you have loved, and somebody who loved you to the best way they possibly could. Lyle, it's been many years of marriage for you and Lois, and today it's a time to say goodbye to that. Not forever, but for this time. For the daughters, each of you is saying goodbye in your own way. There's a mother that you are not going to be able to visit in the Bueller Center. There's a mother you're not going to be able to say, I love you, even if she wouldn't remember that the next day. You can't say that anymore to her and have her respond to you. For the grandchildren, a grandmother who taught games, who was gentle, who was a teacher, a grandmother who perhaps asked you to live in certain ways and you weren't sure you wanted to live exactly that way. Uh, things change a little bit. A grandmother who learned that affection later in life was a good thing to show. And from that generation, it was often very difficult to show a lot of affection. That's just not the way it was done. Today, it's very different. And I hope it's different because we learn and we grow. And for great-grandchildren, they're going to remember Lois through your memories. They're going to remember her through what you remember because they might not have those memories for themselves. I heard today about a teacher, a wife, a mother, and a grandmother, and that that was Lois's dream to be those things. Her dreams came true. There's something to be said for that. Her dreams came true, and you sitting here today our testimony to the fact that many of her dreams did come true. She loved books, and I just have that image of her with a book, and if it was me, it would have been The Lord of the Rings. That's the kind of book, I, and I could stand there in the middle of a room and read for an hour, and then my dad would come in and say, but haven't you been out to clean the yard yet, to rake? Oh, I'm sorry. And he would say, you're just like your mom. You're just like your mother. Stories that she told and a gentle smile. Every day she would come into church. Every Sunday she would come in, there would be that smile. She probably didn't recognize me from the week before, but there was that smile nevertheless. There was a relationship at that moment, and that smile mattered on a Sunday morning. And I feel like I'm writing the obituary for my own mother. Everything that you have said could have been about my mother except for one thing. My mother was my mother, not yours. And your mom is your mom and not mine. And so the memories you have today are special to your mom and your grandmother, to your wife. And that's what's really, really uh, unique about relationships. 
My mom grew up on a farm. My mom loved taking care of animals. She was the best picker of raspberries that I ever saw, or strawberries. Even at 78 years old, with diminishing memory, she could be two-thirds of the way down a strawberry row, and I would still be starting at the beginning. And she wouldn't have left anything behind. She knew what to do, because she grew up in a generation where that's what you did. You worked hard, and you did things right. Today we're talking about your mother, your grandmother, your wife, and that's unique and that's special. And it's wonderful that we can celebrate that here. Uh, I've done some work in refugee camps where when somebody died, there was no funeral. Families couldn't get together and people were buried in unmarked graves. This didn't happen. Don't take this for granted. This is a special thing to be here today, for somebody to share the stories, if you did today on behalf of your family, for the music that we've heard here today, to hear you sing. That, that's a gift that you give to people, and it's a gift God has given to you to be able to do that. And like I say, I've seen places where that has not been possible, and people have suffered for generations because of that. Lois knew a little bit about how to love, maybe a lot about how to love. But today we're not just remembering death, we're remembering life and the assurance that she has moved on to a different aspect of her life. She's walked through a door, if you will. She's crossed a great divide, she's on the other side. She's taken that step from here to there. And in 1 John 4 verse 10, it says this, this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us first, and that he sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And Lois believed that. It just was her testimony. She believed that God had come and saved her. And so today, she's in a peaceful place. She didn't just disappear. She's in a place where she doesn't have to worry about memory. She doesn't have to worry about broken bones. And Linda, you made a list before of how many bones your mother had actually broken. It was pretty extensive. It even beat mine, and I've had five or six, right? Um, she doesn't have to worry about those things anymore. She is just at peace. And I wish I could describe peace for people, but I can't, because I haven't experienced it completely. But I will one day when I'm in the same place as Lois, and we will one day when we're in that same place. Just want to leave you with this word, and it also comes directly from what Jesus said. He said, trust in God and trust in me. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it weren't so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if it weren't so, and if I wasn't going to prepare a place for you, would I have told you that? And would I be coming back to get you? Well, a few days ago, Jesus came and put his hand out and said, Lois, I want you to come home. And that's what happened, and that's where she is. And today we're celebrating her life here, but we're also celebrating with hope and faith her life there. Because after all, there's three things that remain, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love, and you're here today to show each other how much you love Lois and how much she loved you. And I would simply say to you, a life well lived for her, a job well done, and a job well done to you as a family for coming here and just acknowledging your love for her and her love for you. May the Lord be with you. I'm going to call on the, I think it's grandchildren coming up now to do some tributes I'm not sure whose name is first, but I'm looking forward to hearing some more stories. Please. A memory from Sarah. I have many great memories of Grandma playing with us when we would go out to the farm to visit. When I was small, I particularly loved sitting on Grandma's lap and playing the game, This is the Way the Gentleman Rides. Clip-clop, clip-clop, clip-clop. 
The game always ended with lots of laughter as Grandma swung me around to demonstrate how a cowboy rides. Hobble de hoy, hobble de hoy. A memory from Rachel. When I was younger, Grandma showed me how, if I listened carefully, I could hear her watch ticking. I loved to listen to that watch ticking. I would climb up on her lap and put my ear to the watch and hold as still as possible until I could hear it. I think this small memory represents one of the things I loved about Grandma. When I was with Grandma, I knew that she was glad to be with me and always had time for me. When we were together, she would help me to stop and notice simple details in the world. A watch ticking, a bird's nest. Being with Grandma, I learned about how wonderful it is to notice things together with another person. A memory from Grace. It was really special that Grandma made afghans for her grandchildren and let each of us choose our own yarn color. She always had her crochet bag with her and she would pull it out whenever we were all sitting down together. Grandma's taught us three sisters how to knit and crochet. I have fond memories of her casting on for us, then kindly and gently explaining how to wrap the yarn around the needle and slip the stitch off the end. And Rachel made um, dishcloths for us all this year. And mom asked, oh, how did you learn how to knit? Did you look it up on YouTube? Rachel said, no, grandma taught us how to knit. Grandma gave all of us grandchildren so much love and attention. And a memory from the three of us. When we were girls, we stayed overnight with grandma and grandpa without mom and dad. Grandma would put us to bed. She would always sing us a song or lullaby before saying goodnight. We loved Pancakes Lissola and Grandfather's Clock, but our most requested song was Billy Bones, about Billy dancing around the world with his cat. We knew Billy Bones had lots of verses, and that meant Grandma would have to stay with us and keep singing for a long, long time. building a little bit off of Grace's last story. Uh, when I was around 10 years old, Grandma and Grandpa came to Kenora for a visit. One morning, I was watching Grandma knit and asked her if she could teach me how to as well. She sat down beside me and proceeded to slowly walk me through all the steps until I told her that I was left-handed. She looked thoughtful for a moment and as she figured out how to replicate all the movements in reverse, she moved her fingers around in trial and error. We sat there for quite some time until I got a handle on it and felt very proud of learning this new skill. The next time my family went to visit Grandma and Grandpa at the farm, Grandma asked me if I had still been knitting and I told her that I had not. So once again, she patiently sat down with me, repracticed how to do everything in its mirror image, then taught me again. Again, I was excited and again, I forgot how to knit shortly after. Each and every visit after that for about the next four or five visits, Grandma would ask me if I remembered how to knit, and when I said no, she would patiently and thoughtfully reteach me. She even got me my own needles and some pink yarn to practice with. Not once did she ever seem irritated or bothered by her granddaughter's lack of consistency. Rather, she just seemed happy to be passing along this simple pleasure of hers to someone else in the family. I still have the needles and the beginnings of a raggedy looking scarf that I never did finish in a box of craft supplies I've kept over the years. It brings me a great deal of happiness whenever I randomly and unexpectedly come across it. This is something that I posted on Facebook the day that Grandma died. Happy first week in heaven to a cheeky girl who grew up into a teacher, a regal bride, and later my grandma. To this lady who is fiercely proud of her family, both ancestors and descendants, who showed me that love was more than words and that hard work was a part of life, so no point complaining. Who never really wanted to be six feet tall, so she quit measuring who arranged for my parents to meet each other, who taught me my first lessons in sewing, piano, and crochet, 
who had a song for everything, who was never shy to correct her grandkids' grammar, who carefully had one hug for everyone before leaving, who was my birthday buddy and blew out many candles with me, who, retri who retired from trucking, likely five years in a row, who never got hot, bothered, or fussy about things, but managed to make even farm work look great slipful, who taught me how to dance, who forgot in the last few years to be, to be quite so proper and pull out some fierce wit. Grandma, your memory has lost, has lost us slowly. Now you are holy and actually gone. We miss you. See you again someday. Thank you all for those memories. It's probably not so easy to get up here and share them. Sometimes it's a bit difficult, and I, I thank you for that. Uh, we're coming to the conclusion of this part of the service. We will be having a few songs yet, and I'll be having a closing prayer before that. But after the songs, if the pallbearers could meet uh, at the back with uh, Mark from Doyle's, and we will follow to the cemetery out that way. Um, and the cemetery is an important part of things. That's a place that can feel like the final kind of goodbye, and it, it's important to be there. But before we do that, two things. I'd like to just pray a blessing on you as a family, and then I'm looking forward to participating in some songs that are songs that would have been her favorites and uh, songs that I know from my childhood, and I haven't sung them in quite a while. And so I'm looking forward to that. My voice isn't great, so I'll keep it quiet, but I will be singing those songs with all of you. So as we come to the conclusion here, I would just like to pray a blessing on you as a family, and if you'll join me. May the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord shine his face on you, and may the Lord give you peace. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the communion that goes with that be with you, be your comfort, be your solace, and be part of your rejoicing on this day that we're saying goodbye to Lois here on earth, but remembering that she is alive somewhere else. The Lord be with you. Amen and amen. Let's sing, please. I think that Grandma would have had a lot of fun with that type of. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
That brings us to the conclusion here. I think our instructions are for the pallbearers to meet with you at the back here, first of all, and the rest of us will follow out. Um, just a last word of thank you to all of you for your sharing, for the love that you've shown, and just being able to be here and an assurance that through the recording, there's a lot of other people that will see this. I've been at several funerals now where it's been recorded and I think actually more people see a funeral that way than if it was just in person without the recording. So it might seem like a few people here, but there's a whole cloud of folks out there who will be listening to this and hearing how you've talked about a family member that you love. So God be with you and let's have the pallbearers join at the back. So I'll try to talk loud enough, but the wind is blowing from you to me, so my voice is going that direction. And it's nice that you're all there because Lyle's somewhat protected in this weather. But uh, Lyle, how many years have you had to put up with Manitoba weather? Yeah, 89 years. So I guess you're kind of used to it, eh? <laughs> Um, but the time here is going to be short for me. This is a time for you to say goodbye. It's a personal time here. But I just want to leave you with the thoughts of, uh, of a one psalm and a prayer. And then this is your time. Uh, but this is a time where we talk about comfort for you. And it's one thing to, to say that, yes, she lived a good long life and <coughs> we're happy that she's okay. Now, but there's also a grief, and there also is a loss, and there's a, a gap, there's a hole in the family, because she's no longer here. And so today is about loss, and so I want to leave you with these words, words that were asked of me that I would share here, and words that I read this morning, actually, in preparing for this. And it's from Psalm 121. I lift my, my, my eyes to the mountains, and in our case, maybe to the escarpment there behind the snow somewhere. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, who he watches over you will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord does watch over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon, <coughs> excuse me, by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. That's what he did with Lois, and that's what he does with each one of us. He watches over us, and he doesn't slumber. He's awake. He's with us 24-7, and that's our comfort going ahead. There is a hole in this life, but now it's a hole that we fill with other things. The Lord be with you. Let's just pray. God, as we commit the body of Lois to the earth, we know that she is no longer here. 
She is somewhere else that we imagine, that we have faith uh, that we will be a part of. She's in a place where she's loved with the love that as much as there's love in this family, the love now is beyond even that. She's in a place of no pain and no sorrow, just in a place of perfect peace. We thank you for that. We thank you for taking her with you, but I pray for the family that you comfort them, that they look to you for comfort, and that they know that you are there for them. So now as we commit her body to the earth, Lord, we thank you for her life, we thank you for family, and we thank you for this kind of a day, uh, a day that you have made. And we pray all this in your name, in the name of our Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is your time, and uh, blessings to each one of you.